It's August in a presidential election year, and that means it is time for the American political parties to have their conventions. Well, it would be, but this is 2020. COVID-19 and its associated disruptions have made the conventions impractical. Both the Democratic and Republican parties have decided to go without a public convention at this time. This was already an unconventional election, but now even more so. Literally unconventional, in fact. To me, that's worth discussing. About five years ago, America set off on a completely unprecedented path in national elections. It was about that time that someone without a single minute of public service declared his candidacy for the Oval Office. While there were a few other candidates in American history who had neither experience in public office nor prior military service, until Donald Trump, none were ever in real contention for the presidency. Few people thought that Donald Trump would be elected. When Ann Coulter said that Donald Trump was going to be the Republican nominee at the beginning of the primary season, she was nearly laughed off the stage. He was supposed to go away, but Trump didn't go away. Speech after speech, debate after debate, Trump slowly overcame all of the more experienced candidates in the GOP. Then he faced Hillary Clinton, and no one in the political establishment thought that he stood a chance. After all, Hillary was an experienced politician. She was a lawyer and a political insider. She was unstoppable. And then Trump beat her. Oh, not in the national popular vote. There she racked up a three million vote advantage. But as people have been pointing out for the last four years, she didn't win the electoral vote. Why? Because she won blue states with huge margins, and Trump won red states with comfortable margins. In most battleground states, Trump won by narrow margins. The national popular vote only matters now because of the national popular vote interstate compact, but we'll get to that. The system for assigning electors is winner-take-all in 49 of the 51 jurisdictions which apportion electors, folks. Margin of victory is only significant if it forces a recount. Only in Maine and Nebraska does it matter what individual congressional districts decide. I actually think that Maine and Nebraska have the right idea, but that's a different video. The results of the 2016 election revealed how deeply divided America has become. Donald Trump's election didn't divide the country. The country's political divisions were the reason that Trump was elected. While the national GOP leadership believed that America wanted more neoconservatism, the average Republican voter didn't want more of their party compromising their principles and positions while the Democratic Party kept demanding more concessions. That's why, despite all of the outrage from the existing leadership at the time, Donald Trump won the GOP nomination. In the general election, the neocons believed that Trump couldn't defeat Clinton, and in fact shouldn't because he would change the party they led. Clinton and her campaign didn't believe that he could beat her, as he had few qualifications at all and none which they believe mattered. He also had quite a few skeletons in his closet, and everyone knew it. What all of these people forgot was that certain fundamental issues determine nearly every election. The economy is number one. Hillary probably would have known this if she had bothered to ask her husband about it. Change is another, and a candidate normally can't run on a platform of change when their party is the incumbent party. It doesn't make sense to moderates and swing voters. Electing someone from the same party as the outgoing president is what voters do when they want to maintain the status quo. Swing voters broke for Trump, so much so that states with a history of voting Democratic backed him. That suggests that Americans didn't want more of former President Obama's policies. It also suggests that they trusted Trump, the political neophyte, more than Hillary, the political insider. That didn't sit well with the Washington establishment. Whether politicians or bureaucrats, lobbyists or media, those who have held the reins of power for most of America's history weren't about to just hand things over to a venture capitalist and reality television star. We've been watching their struggle against him for four years now. 2020 is supposed to be the year that they force him out of office. Unfortunately for all of us, 2020 is also what historians would call an interesting year. COVID-19 has thrown everything for a loop. Normally, candidates are hitting the campaign trail all year. 
There are rallies. There are debates. There are lots of political ads. There are lots and lots of appearances and handshakes. And there are political conventions, after which there are bounces in the polls. Not this year. Rallies are not well attended when they happen because of COVID concerns and COVID concern trolling. Political ads are curtailed, too, because advertising costs money and fundraising is usually done via in-person events. No fundraising events means a lot less money for advertising. Appearances are limited, and handshakes are currently unacceptable. Evidently, so are the conventions. People gathering together in large groups isn't kosher with COVID-19 safety measures in most cases this year. The conventions normally feature attendees in the thousands, if not tens of thousands, all gathered together in one spot to hear politicians speak and cheer on policy measures. So, for much the same reason that rallies aren't really playing well and appearances have become socially distanced press conferences or televised by remote feeds, both parties have agreed to cancel their conventions. A series of Zoom meetings and related online activities will replace these gatherings. That leaves just the debates to let America size up the nominees against each other. At least two of the venues have rescinded their offers to host a debate over COVID-19 concerns. It's possible that the other venues will adopt remote appearances by the candidates and moderators, which would leave these important events as little more than live streams. We are used to incumbent presidents turning trips to places where there are actual problems into campaign events instead of campaigning conventionally. After all, incumbents seeking re-election still have a job to do, at least until the January after the election. What they aren't used to seeing is a ghost candidacy. The incumbent may be busy, but the challenger normally has nothing better to do than to appear here, there, and everywhere. Not Joe Biden in 2020, though. Biden is in the high-risk category for serious, even fatal effects from a COVID infection. With over 4.5 million Americans diagnosed with COVID-19, up to 10 times as many walking around asymptomatic and potentially infectious, and at least 150,000 Americans dead from the disease, Biden is Hyden. I get it. I really do. But with a candidate in seclusion, normally we might expect that the polls would show that candidate trailing, not leading. Biden is leading in most polls, though. Why is that? Well, his opponent is Trump, for starters. Like him or hate him, most people have strong opinions on the current president. Trump pisses off more people accidentally before breakfast than most people can piss off on purpose all week. Social media is filled with people talking about Trump, too. That's significant because social media is a great public square for activists, because the average social media user is a young adult, and because young adult activists are typically loud supporters of progressive policies. That means that social media, where most legacy media companies are trying to extend their reach, is filled with people who don't want to hear anything positive about Donald Trump. Add to that the fact that social media is the spiritual home of cancel culture, and the fact that 62% of Americans are afraid that expressing their political opinions will negatively affect their careers, and you get what we see today. Everything Trump does is reported as wrong and ripped apart on social media. Biden also draws some negative attention, but is more likely to be ignored despite the obvious problems with his candidacy. Trump excites people on both sides of the aisle, while Biden is ahead simply because he isn't Trump. I'm looking forward to the debates. When they finally happen, I'm fairly certain that Trump will make Biden look like an idiot. If so, then there might just be enough of a swing in popular support to put Trump over the top in the only poll which matters, the one on November 3rd. Even Election Day is an issue, though, as Trump wants people to mask up and vote, while Biden wants people to be able to vote from the comfort of their home by mail. We've had absentee balloting for a long time, in which voters may request ballots be mailed to them when they can't get to the polls on Election Day. For the most part, absentee balloting works just fine. I have voted by absentee ballot when I was on overseas deployment. Vote by mail isn't absentee balloting, though, and it's time for the media to stop pretending that they are the same thing. Vote by mail will send everyone an absentee ballot, even people who might have died or people who might have moved to another state. Those ballots have to be completed and postmarked by Election Day, and every state has a time limit for those ballots to arrive if they're going to be counted. If the signature on the ballot doesn't match the signature on record, then the ballot won't be counted either. Either way, absentee ballots are the ballots most likely to be challenged during an election, and I can foresee both parties arguing that the election results are invalid because of disenfranchisement 
and fraud. At least we don't have to worry about the national popular vote interstate compact, though. It only kicks in if states representing at least 270 electoral votes join, and right now only 187 are confirmed. Nine more are pending the result of a statewide referendum in Colorado, and 64 more may yet be pledged by states with pending legislation. That leaves the compact short of eliminating the Electoral College as a functioning body, which provokes all sorts of interesting legal questions. It's an unconventional election, all right. I'll be watching closely.